to be able to introduce Professor Joshua Mitz from Columbia Law School. He is a prolific author, and the reason we're talking to him primarily is because he has graciously agreed to answer some questions about his paper, Short and Distort, which I'm sure many of you have read. Um, but I am going to ask him a few preliminary questions about it. It's now been uh, three years since the great debate at FraudFest 2019 between Josh and Carson Block, and a lot has changed since then. Um, and and uh, Josh, you've been criticized uh, recently by some short sellers, including in the media. So we wanted to give you a chance to respond. And, and then after this, after people watch your video, we'll have a, another great debate uh, at FraudFest, this time between Carson Block and Rob Jackson. So let's just get a little bit of preliminaries out of the way first. I think most people have either read the article or know what it says, but just give us a little bit of background at how, how you came to write Short and Distort. Sure. Well, thanks very much, Frank, for having me. And I'm delighted that we're getting a chance to, to dig into this. So, you know, Short and Distort arose really, I think, uh, in, in great part to this emerging phenomenon uh, of activist short selling. So, I, uh, you know, we had witnessed over the really the preceding 10, 15 years, just a, a substantial increase in the volume of activist short reports, which were being written about companies. And I think, you know, as you yourself have written, the role that short activists play is, is akin to filling in a missing piece, a, a gap, if you will, in the markets. Um, we know that the SEC and our enforcement authorities often fall short of detecting corporate fraud. And so uh, much like securities class action plaintiffs have an economic incentive to bring securities class actions and deter corporate fraud, so also active short sellers by building up a short position have an incentive to bring information to the market about a company. Uh, and so you know, watching this phenomenon emerge over the past 10 to 15 years, I became interested in the question, you know, is there like any positive phenomenon in the world? Are there excesses or are there places where abuse might be happening? And I was particularly interested in the role of pseudonymity because we know in markets that reputation is a critical mechanism to hold actors accountable. Uh, a, a good name if you will, is, is the means by which the market dis disciplines and rewards uh, those who are taking economic risks. And so I was fascinated really, but with the question, what happens when you can change your name? What happens when you can recycle identities? And, and that's really what Short and Distort looks at. And so uh, we as uh, empir empiricists are always looking for good data sets. Talk us through how you found this data set that, that in, it, it was the appropriate data set for you to use and then uh, what your basic findings were. Sure. So the phenomenon of pseudonymity really needed to flourish in, a, in an environment where pseudonymity was uh, enforceable in the sense that, you know, if you have a, if, if, if anyone can assume any name, uh, it just seems like pseudonymity is not going to work. So Seeking Alpha was the perfect setting to study because what Seeking Alpha did was allow anyone to create an account under a pseudonymous identity. Uh, that then pseudonymous identity is linked to whoever created that account. So you can actually build up a reputation in that identity. So Seeking Alpha was a, a great place, I thought, to look. Uh, for postings, articles by those who had short ideas or short theses about companies. So what the study did was look at thousands of those articles, and there's lots of econometric and statistical methods we can get into as to how the final sample was chosen. But the goal was to look at those cases which were as similar as possible between pseudonymous and non-pseudonymous authors and to see how stock prices reacted and to look at accompanying trading behavior in the options market. And really the key finding of the paper is that pseudonymous articles are followed by Vs in the stock price. Not always full Vs, sometimes something more like a hockey stick, but that there are price reversals following articles published by pseudonymous authors, uh, which are not present on average for articles followed by real name authors. And the study also shows that in the options market, we see trading patterns which look like possibly forms of market manipulation. That is positions which are taken uh, with the goal of either inducing a price reversal or at the very least expecting that sort of price reversal 
uh, positions which would seem to be difficult to explain as the product of ordinary non-manipulative market activity. That's great. And it's a really nice summary of your abstract, which I'm looking at right now, which was a very clear way for people to access the basic point. And, and one of the more controversial aspects of this is that, the, that as you, said, you say, the patterns are likely driven by manipulative stock options trading by uh, by these these authors and and so that was one piece of the of the uh, findings that that was uh, controversial. The other uh, piece is the mispricing, right? The twenty point one uh, billion dollars of mispricing. Um, there's been some criticism that that's small, that the twenty billion is small. Can you help us understand that in context as well? Sure. So it's it is a a number which you know need some context to make sense of. The, the number is derived from looking at roughly 2,000 cases in the main sample of the paper, but critically, over just five trading days following the publication of the article on Seeking Alpha. So what I'm doing is measuring how much prices in total end up reverting, how much dollar volume of trading there is over just a five-day window. Now, some might say that's actually a lot. If you think about uh, how you know how much trading that reflects in such a short window, of course, compared to the aggregate market cap decline uh, that often accompanies uh, uh, short reports, uh, it might be a small number. But you know, to make an apples and apples comparison, we have to think about time windows. The reason why it's such a short period of time is because one of the challenges we have, and you've written on this, uh, is 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 that it's really difficult to measure long run effects with 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 certainty. Um, we we certainly need to be doing it, but we often have the best. Uh, confidence in our results by looking at short-term event study-like windows. And that's what my study seeks to do. And I know you and others have continued to look at longer horizons, but that's 20 billion over five trading days, over a seven-year period, seven to eight years. Right. Well, I guess we should say that as well. So the time period that we're talking about for these Seeking Alpha articles is what time period? 2010 to 2017. And it's, um, it's just looking at that sample. So, you know, if you were to say round numbers, you know, 2000 companies, 20 billion, that's something like what, $10 million a company, of course, it's not evenly distributed. Uh, those a lot of those are, are mid caps and large caps. So these are larger companies, maybe on a percent basis of their market cap, it might be a small number. On the other hand, uh, what it reflects is potentially a substantial volume of investor losses to for that is those who sold at the at the on the day of a short report uh, may have sold at a price which was too low so the price reversal at the, the aggregate dollar volume basically in a sense reflects potent possible investor losses to selling on the days of these short reports okay now we'll get into some of the criticisms now but before doing that i just want to point out um, that the article is published in the Journal of Legal Studies, which is a peer-reviewed publication in 2020. It went through a lot of comments. Uh, I know um, uh, I didn't comment on it, but but I knew uh, there's a long list of many people, sort of a who's who of the Academy who have commented on it. So it's not like you just wrote this thing and then it was published, right? It went through several iterations, but ultimately the final version, which, which you stand behind, was published in a, in a top journal, right? That's, that's right. I think there's just two really critical points there. One is that the uh, uh, draft itself and the conclusions of the draft actually were unchanged from when I posted it on SSRN in June 2018, all the way through the moment of publication, which was in early 2020. So the, the, the paper's principal findings uh, as well as the estimates, the quantitative estimates in the paper really didn't change over that period. The referee feedback, uh, which was very extensive, concerned a number of additional tests and, and language and things of that nature. The referee feedback actually spoke to some of the questions which were raised publicly about the paper. And so there, there's discussions in the in the later versions of the paper, which are responsive to some extent to some of, of the uh, public uh, concerns that have been raised, because they were also raised and addressed to the satisfaction of the referees during the peer review process. Okay, so I think that's very important to get out of the way up front. But now I'm going to take take the gloves off and give you the hard uh, questions about some of the criticism, um, some of which, as you said, uh, you addressed 
uh, in the paper, but but some of which has um, been subject to public criticism since then, uh, in ways that the criticizers find unsatisfactory in the paper. So, um, so so let's start off with the one that these are not really short sellers. The Seeking Alpha um, is, in, and your data set uh, only has one of five roughly uh, who are actually written by people who were short the stock. So I know in in, in my own research with with Peter Mulk and Barbara Bliss and. Um, continuing research, this is a tough one, depending on which data set you use, whether you've actually isolated short selling and activist short selling. So respond to that criticism. It's really, really only one in five. All right. So, so look, first of all, let me say that I think it's terrific that whether it's folks from industry or in the academy, people are doing what was done to arrive at that number um, and just this may not be clear to everyone, but I posted a replication data set of the paper. Um, it's something I believe in. I think it's important that we're replicating and we're digging in the data. So when I published the paper, I posted that replication data set. The calculation of one in five comes from uh, a data field, which was not actually used in the paper. And it's searching for certain textual phrases in those Seeking Alpha articles. It's likely to be actually an under-inclusive number because people can disclose their positions in different ways. But for, for purposes of our discussion, let's, let's concede, I'll concede, uh, it's not 100%, right? It might even, it might be 30%, it might be 40%, it's probably more than 20, but it, it, it is definitely the case that a number of the articles written in the short theses category on Seeking Alpha were written by individuals who did not publicly disclose in their article that they had a short position. Now, I, I think that's a terrific point to bring up for, for conversation because I think it gets at one of the ways in which short activism is a lot like other forms of activism. And you've written on this, negative activism. Well, we know that hedge fund activism tends to involve, in many cases, uh, what are sometimes called wolf packs, and derog you know, it's an almost derogatory term, but the term is used to refer to those who may be participating in an activist campaign, who may be opening positions prior to an activist announcing their, their, their stake. Here, you can you know, what what the data seem to suggest is that in many of these cases, the options trading and the short positions may be opened by individuals who are not the authors of those posts. Now, I think that's a fascinating point, right? I mean, what it what it gets at is that the role of these articles and their ability to move prices may not depend entirely on the author, and that there could be others who are involved in the chain of trading, both prior to and potentially following the publication of the article who may have been involved before the article was, was posted. So uh, I think it's a, it's a really critical point because it gets at some of the difficult policy issues here. We know that you know unless there's a duty, it's not going to lead to insider trading liability. We could have a conversation about that to trade on tipped information. Um, but I think what we don't know, much like in the hedge fund activist setting, is who might know about a forthcoming article and who might be trading on it. So what the paper says is, look, the timing of these articles, the day they're coming out, is really only known to the author or the Seeking Alpha editorial staff or the those who may have been tipped by that author. So it seems unlikely that we're picking up on average across about 2,000 cases just random trading in the market, it seems more likely that what this could reflect are tippies or those who may be working uh, with authors and trading in advance of an author's report, even if that author discloses that they personally have no position. And that's just to be clear, all Seeking Alpha is asking those authors to do is to disclose their personal stakes. So in the paper, um, why call it all short and distort? Why not distinguish between people who are short and versus these two other theories, which might be publish and distort or tip and distort, which are very different, right? And, and if you're conceding that 30, only 30% 30 of the database is actually shorts, shouldn't it be characterized as only 30% really of the paper's findings are about short sellers and the rest, yes, there's a story that surrounds it, but we don't actually have empirical support for it being either tipping or publishing on its own, right? Because we can't parse the data set to see how much was reflected in insiders piggybacking on this information versus just the effect of publishing on its own? 
Sure. So, so the term short and distort, uh, besides the fact that it rhymes, is in, in many ways uh, referring to the short thesis, right? So the articles are taken from the short thesis section of Seeking Alpha. These aren't, you know, Seeking Alpha had at the time, at least a short thesis and a long thesis section, short ideas and long ideas. So whoever's posting these articles is doing so to advance a short thesis. Now, I think you're absolutely right, Frank, if it is very different in maybe really important ways to distinguish between the case where an author might be, for example, getting paid by a short seller to write an article uh, and uh, versus uh, the author themselves having an economic stake. But I'm not sure that case where the author is being paid by someone who has a position is in any way less of a short activist case, right? I, I, and I think that's, the, you know, the question that it seems, in, in, and this is, I think, a really great point for debate, is there really a difference between, a, from, a, from, a, uh, from the standpoint of understanding this phenomenon of short activism, between the short seller personally writing the article or paying someone or providing some other kind of compensation for someone else to write the article? If, if there's no substantive difference in the trading and in the implications for investors, um, I, I would submit it is a form of short activism, but you're absolutely right. And one of the things the paper says is with publicly available data, we don't know in any case who is trading when because our data are anonymized. So at best, what we're saying is in connection with these short theses, there is trading which cannot be explained uh, in, in all likelihood as the product of ordinary market activity. And it very may very well be in the realm of likelihood that these are orchestrated short campaigns against companies, but the author of the post doesn't necessarily hold the short position as opposed to someone else who they might be working with. I think that's actually a very interesting form of, of short activism. So it's uh, just to be clear, though, just to button it down, it sounds like you're not willing to concede that the other 70 percent that you were overclaiming with respect to the other 70 percent that you think it's it's impossible to tell empirically whether these people actually were paid by a short seller or maybe paid by someone else or not paid that they would fall into different categories. But but you're stick, standing firm with your claim that these are all related to short selling and are properly categorized as as that as that as being uh, related to short selling yeah well the, the it's a great point so the paper i do stand behind the use of seeking alpha's categorization right and the paper is very clear about that the paper says among the articles which are listed in the short theses section of, of seeking alpha the paper doesn't characterize that group as all being activist short sellers or or prominent activist short sellers in fact most activist short sellers who use their real name are not going to be in the, they're not going to be in what we call the treatment group. They're going to be in the control group. They're going to be the benchmark by which we compare the pseudonyms. So the, the paper is pretty clear that that's the group of articles we're studying are those published in the short ideas section of Seeking Alpha. Other people might characterize the paper as saying something different than what it says. Paper doesn't say that these authors are per se short sellers. It acknowledges explicitly the possibility that they might be tipping. Uh, it just says, we're gonna look at short ideas that are published on Seeking Alpha. Yeah, good. This And this is something you and I have talked about over the last several years, where if you're studying different databases, you really are studying different databases and we should be careful about the conclusions that that we draw. Absolutely. Um, so thank you for, I, uh, those are, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm punching away here, uh, but, 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 uh, but we really appreciate it. I think it's great to clarify uh, these issues for our audience. Another um, important, I think, uh, area of criticism has been how you cut the data set in terms of market cap. And you've been criticized for only including companies with a market cap of, um, of 1.5 or 2 billion or or higher and there have been some claims that that um that that um, uh, companies with a market cap of maybe 500 million or lower have different results so could you just talk us through um how you made the cut how you think through that cut and uh how you respond to the criticisms about how you made the cut great so uh, before i get into the substance i'll just say again this uh, this sample selection point 
uh, was not only discussed in the paper, but it's something you can evaluate by downloading the replication data set, which includes the entire data set. So, so you know, for those who, who are wondering, um, was there transparency on this point? Yes and yes, there was transparency in the replication data set, but also the article talks about it both in the body of the text and in a footnote. Having said that, what the article says, and, and what I think is really important to understand, is that there is a big difference between analyzing activist short selling and analyzing price reversals, reversals, Vs, after activist short reports. And the difference is that if you're trying to figure out was a given short report manipulative or putting out inaccurate information, you're going to have to assume that the market is, is efficient enough, fast enough to correct the mispricing within a period of time that you're studying. In my case, that was five trading days. So in order to build a sample that was meaningful to study, I had to say, all right, what are the kinds of firms where I think there will be a V within five trading days if the article is false or manipulative or in some way not accurately leading to the, the accurate price of the company? The, the finding and the, the concept and the idea that larger firms trade in more efficient markets is a very standard assumption. And in fact, uh, price reversals are typically found in, more quickly for, among larger and in, in mid-cap firms. So um, for example, we know that in securities litigation, the ability to bring class actions is usually limited to those companies where we can find a presumption of market efficiency. And the courts have said that's driven by how quickly the stock price updates and reacts. It's a function of, of many things, most of which are correlated with firm size. So the, the larger a firm is, the more analyst coverage it has, the more attention there's going to be to that firm. And so it's for that reason that not just my paper, but prior literature has found that price reversals following investor overreactions are likely to happen within a short period of time for larger firms. And I cite some of that literature in the paper. And the paper explains that that's, that's the reason why it's going to happen. And, um, and you can think about it intuitively, like it, we just know a lot more about mid caps and large caps. We have a good sense as to, we, we're spending a lot more time as an investing community, if you will, figuring out what those companies are worth. And so it's for that reason that the market is likely to pick up on an overreaction in the price or a manipulated price decline and bid it back up quickly. That's the reason for studying those cases. And it's the reason for focusing the analysis on those cases. Just in terms of the theory behind the V, um, one, one theory would be uh, it's, it's an overreaction and then it, it's corrected within the five-day period. A, a second theory would be it's the market reacting efficiently to this negative information. And then the company either leaking or publishing uh, different information that's positive, that it's maybe been holding back. How do we distinguish between those two theories? Yeah, so you know the latter theory, I think, is, is very nicely put out formally um, in a paper by my colleague, Eric Talley, who makes the point that larger firms have a more powerful economic incentive to correct mispricing in the way you describe, Frank, which is to put counter information out. Um, and, and in his model, which is a 20, 25 page mathematical model, he basically shows that you can think about it in terms of a fixed cost, that because it takes effort to investigate claims, larger firms are more likely to credibly signal that they have the capacity to investigate those claims and correct that mispricing fairly quickly. Uh, I think it's, it's, you know, that theory didn't, that form of a theory didn't occur to me when I wrote the paper. I talked in the paper uh, uh, at, a, at a more general level about the ability of arbitrageurs to correct mispricing. But I think this just shows why we need more dialogue and discussion in, in literature engaging with these questions. Because you could imagine empirically testing this, Frank, right, with, uh, by looking at what companies are saying in that five-day window. And right? that's something I didn't do in this paper, uh, but I think would be a terrific subject for a, for a follow-up paper. Are larger firms going out there and, and putting more information out than smaller firms, is that 
is that a factor in understanding the price reversal? The only other thing I'll say is even if we, it's still possible, even if we don't measure that in the data, that larger firms have other sort of softer ways to credibly signal. And so, you know, one of the challenges we have sometimes with smaller firms, and we see this in biotech and other sectors, is that it's just often really hard to know what the company is doing for real. We, it's just a little bit of a black box to the market. Um, and, and whether they are or not a fraud, it's just hard to figure out in many cases. So it could be just that for larger firms, they're less of a black box. They have better governance. They have better internal processes. So even if they're not speaking actively to the market, the market can quickly figure out whether there's, tr there's truth, if you will, or meat to this short report, as opposed to you know, a case where, where maybe there was just a, a, a temporary panic, and, and, but, but, but we've come to the conclusion this company is okay. Okay, great. Uh, it, it, that's definitely an open area for all of us to look at. It sounds like um, you are not uh, pushing back against the criticism that the statistical significance of the effect that you find goes away if you make the cut in a different place. If you look at firms of 500 million market cap or lower or 1 billion market cap, or lower that the findings go away. That's not some. That's something that's simply in the data, and if you replicate it, you find that. And you're not you're not resisting that. You're sort of embracing that criticism, but saying it's valid to look only at companies of two billion market cap and higher. Is that a fair summary? It, it is, Frank, with one caveat, which is that if you employ no size cutoff, if you look at the entire sample, the effect is still statistically significant. It, it, so it, if you think about it, like there's uh, a lot, another way to say it is, there's a lot of noise in the smaller firms, right? If we look, if we look at a lot of smaller firms, uh, so that noise may overpower the statistical significance. If we make the data set sufficiently large, we get enough power to still see the effect, but there's no doubt that the effect is coming from the larger firms. The paper describes that um, both in the text and in the footnote as to why I, that sample uh, selection was made, the sample cutoff was made. And one more thing I'll say, you know, that was also something that was the uh, subject of referee uh, feedback. So referees were asking in comments, referees were asking the same question. And so this question came up during the peer review process. That's why it was addressed in the paper. Uh, but it's, it's a terrific point for future work to understand what it is about the nature of some of these companies that makes the price reversal uh, happen within a period of time. So thank you for that as well. It does seem like this kind of a discussion, this sort of open, detailed discussion, helps illuminate where some of the areas of disagreement are and where, where the criticisms um, uh, have responses, at least, that, that might not be explicit in the paper, but, but are at least implicit in uh, the, the reasoning and the process of peer review. Um, there's one more which I want to ask you about, which is maybe the most uh, sharp criticism, which is about uh, your conflicts of interest or alleged conflicts of interest. So um, defend yourself. Well, first, let me say, I think it's, this may sound, you know, hard to believe, but I, I really do think it's important that these questions are being raised, not, not just about me, but about academic research more generally. I talked about putting the replication data set online so that people, other people can find this stuff. I talked about transparency methodologically in the paper. Um, I, I, I think the same holds true for conflicts of interest. So let me make a few substantive points on this. When the paper was posted in June 2018, I had no conflicts of interest. I didn't have a single expert witness case or consulting engagement. I had no consulting company. Uh, the paper is the same paper in, in substance. The quantitative estimates didn't change. I don't want to say that not a single digit changed, but I'm pretty sure almost all the numbers are exactly the same as they were in June 2018. Uh, and that, again, owing to the nature of the referee feedback, which was focused on some of these, these expositional points that we've been discussing uh, and, and, and explanations and so forth of methodology. So it's, it's, it's not that the paper was you know, one thing when I didn't have consulting or expert witness work and it became something very different to satisfy consulting clients or expert witness. It's the same paper uh, from, from 2018 to, to when it was in print in 2020. I think on the on the on the questions that have been raised about disclosure and expert witness work, uh, I you know it for me it goes it sort of goes without saying and and I'll say it anyway that 
I fully complied with Columbia's conflict of interest disclosure rules. In fact, I've gone above and beyond those rules. So for example, Columbia doesn't have any specific rule on what needs to be disclosed in papers or in presentations when one has an expert witness engagement or consulting engagement that may be related to the topic of the paper. In the published paper, as well as in the working paper versions, as soon as I started engaging in expert witness activity, I included a disclosure to that effect. I also included disclosures it, when I presented the paper publicly, sometimes many times throughout the presentation, just to make the point very clear that I testify in these cases. Uh, you know, I think more broadly, Frank, it, it, you know, this, this topic raises, I think, a really important question uh, regarding the relationship between uh, research and impact and, and engagement in the world of practice. Universities have been grappling with these questions, and they've set out a set of rules that, at the very minimum, we should be following. I followed those rules in this case. I'm, you know, proud to say that. But I also think that what some of these questions show is that we need to have transparency around conflicts of interest. And you know, I've tried to do that. I'm happy to answer specific questions as I have uh, repeatedly throughout the last several years working on this project. The last thing I'll say is, you know, conflicts here, I think, in, in, in a very general sense, can really relate to any way in which someone who authored a, a research study may have an economic interest. But there's some sense out there that my work is exclusively for the benefit of corporate management that's been accused by activist short sellers. Um, and, and that really... Uh, is, is it, nothing could be farther from the truth, uh, especially in the last uh, two to three years. Um, there was a period of time, my public testimony in the Farmland Partners case, for example, uh, was you know something that Carson and I talked about uh, on stage uh, at Fraud Fest the last time, and, and I talked about my expert testimony work, uh, paid expert testimony work in that case. Uh, but but you know in recent years. Uh, I've, I've really been doing less and less of that. And what has been publicly disclosed is that I do advise the Department of Justice uh, in connection with securities fraud and market manipulation matters. And so, you know, my work as an expert on these topics is really, it's just inaccurate to characterize it as representing management or trying to advance the agenda of management. Um, that's, especially in the last couple of years, that's just... Uh, completely, completely inaccurate. Uh, and, you know, like anyone who's dug into an area, in, including many of my colleagues and, and just in the academy, we're often called upon to, uh, to, to express our expertise and to advise and to testify. As, you know, I said earlier in, in this discussion, we really need to have clear rules. The university has put those rules out there. Uh, I've complied with them. And I think, you know, broader conversations about this are really important. And I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. I'm glad it's, it's out there. Um, and I'm an open book and happy to talk more about it. I knew that 30 minutes with you would fly by and we could talk for hours. But in the spirit of Fraud Fest, we, we appreciate your candor. We appreciate you being willing to be in front of us. We would love to welcome you back in, in person for a third appearance in the future. And I just want to say thanks very much for spending this time with me. And thank you, Frank, for the opportunity to go through all of this. You've been very patient. It's a lot of it's very technical and a lot of details, but I'm thrilled we had this opportunity, and I hope next time to be there in person. Thanks, Josh.